Hello, welcome to The Cellar Door. I'm Claire. Today we are in the magnificent Yarra Valley and first up we are going to explore the beautiful wines of Yarra Yering. I cannot wait to meet the lovely people behind this brand, so let's go. Janine, you are the Cellador Manager for Yarra Yering. Mm -hmm. How do you introduce such a prestigious brand to your visitors? Uh, so when people arrive, if they're not familiar with Yarra Yering, um, the first thing we say, you know, this is one of Australia's most iconic premium uh, wine brands. And you are in the midst of where it's made, where it's grown, the whole history. This is where it all started. So it's a quite a unique experience in the Yarra Valley. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And so how do you provide such a incredible experience given that you're surrounded by all these vineyards, these mm -hmm. beautiful wines. How do you translate that into the expectation of a visitor? The cellar door experience is quite intimate. We don't, we, we try and have smaller groups of people and it's a very one-on-one -on -one personalised um, yeah. tasting. The tasting's quite extensive. Yeah. So it's not just you can have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You get yeah. 12 wines, the staff are very knowledgeable, you know, we can pour this dry red wine number one, point out the window and say that is what you are drinking. That's so there's a real sense of place and yeah. um, belonging when yeah. you're in here, so you feel quite involved. Absolutely. You know? yeah. So how long does the average person spend here? <laughs> well, um, average, probably about 45 minutes or so, wow. but some people will spend a few hours just just you know, savouring it. Yeah, because the, you know, the nose, the taste, the view, the cats, <laughs> all that, you know, it's, it can be a lovely experience that you can spend a few yeah, hours. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What are the standout wines for you at the moment? Probably our two sort of most iconic, dry red wine number one and dry red wine number two, one being a, a Cabernet Bordeaux blend and the other being a Shiraz, sort of more a Northern Rhone blend. They're probably the standout at the minute. Saying that, I'm a Chardonnay girl at heart, so, you know. <laughs> always love a glass of Chardonnay. Being such a historical, prestigious brand, how do you convey that to your visitors in the cellar door? What can they expect? Okay, so, so when they arrive, I mean, the first thing is they are in the house of Dr Caritas, who started the vineyard in the um, early 70s. So this was his lounge dining room where they're tasting. So already nice. they're... You know, here. amongst the history mm. you know also you know we are in the vineyard so you know we're right in the middle of the vineyard what they're tasting is grown out here made you know just 100 meters away there and of course you know our tastings are quite intimate personalized we have enough staff on always to provide a very one-to-one um, -one experience yeah. and you know the staff are very knowledgeable the tasting is extremely extensive, so you taste all of our wines, including some of the reserved wines if you like. So can you talk us through the history of Sh Yarra Yarra? Sure, so Dr Bailey Caritas uh, bought 30 acres of land out here in the late 60s and started planting in 69. Mm -hmm. He planted uh, Cabernet, sort of the Bordeaux blends, Shiraz, a bit of Pinot, a bit of Chardonnay. Built the house in the 70s, started making wine, I think the first vintage was 73, and continued up until he passed away in 2008. There was no tasting room at that point, right. uh, so he opened one weekend a year, and that was it, out in the back shed. <laughs> if you sold out, the sign would go out, and if you missed out, bad luck. Um, but since 2009, we have turned his lounge dining room into a tasting it's beautiful. room open every day except Christmas Day. <laughs> we all need a day off. We draw the line, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, so historically we are in the middle of it. Mm. Underneath this floor is where the original barrel hall was. And as I said, you know, we're in the middle of this beautiful vineyard. Yeah, aren't so, we? Yeah. Sarah, we are in the cellar of Yarra Yering. Introduce us to the story of Yarra Yering. So uh, we were established in 1969 um, and that's really relevant right now because we're turning 50. 50. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Um, a gentleman called Dr. Bailey Caritas bought the land and planted the vines in 1969. So at the time there was no neighbouring vineyards, um, wow. so he was one of the first to come and he was at the front of this kind of renaissance of the Yarra Valley. So it's quite special mm. and it's always had a reputation for premium wines and wines that really just kind of captivate you and stop you in your tracks when you see them, particularly for the first time. And so this cellar holds the story of that over the years, doesn't it? It's yeah. got... Where do we start? You know, it's got wines from... The early, late 70s? Yes. Up there, 80s. Yep. So. Do you get to taste these? From time to time, <laughs> yeah. Um, That's amazing. It's great because it's a, it's our wine archive and mm. it, does, it does tell the complete history of the vineyard from the first vintage in 1973 all the way to um, the current wines, 2016 vintage. So it's an amazing resource for me as the current winemaker to yeah. be able to come down here and think about uh, the season and how that impacted on sure. the wine and the grapes and the flavours and uh, maybe look at what the alcohol was in a particular okay. uh, similar year um, and if I'm really struggling and have to open a bottle then that's okay too. How do you see yourself as the winemaker in such an established business as such an iconic and incredible reputation? How do you approach that? Yeah, it's like being a, the custodian of the vineyard yeah. um, and the brand as well. So there is, a, I suppose, a pressure on me yeah. to continue <laughs> to carry on the tradition and the history and keep making these iconic wines that will live for a really long time. So I feel the weight of that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I think you're doing OK. <laughs> Winemaker of the year. Yes, I yeah, think you. we're OK. <laughs> So what is on site here? Pretty well everything is on site, from growing the grapes, which we are amongst, to the winery, the winery is yep. there, which goes down three floors, so everything happens over there. Plus under the floor here is our, um, is our archive cellar. All our museum and precious archive wines are all kept here as well. Yes. So it's all encompassing here. Amazing. The vineyards are all in this little pocket. Yep, yep. Um, so we're about in the middle of it in this tasting room. Great. So there's about 80 acres. Wow. Quite a lot of varieties. About 24. Can you remember ish. all of them? Of course I can. I don't think we've got time to run through them at the moment. Um, but you know, predominantly Cabernet and Shiraz. Mm -hmm. But then we also have Pinot, Chardonnay, and you know, plenty of others that, yes. that go into the blends. And we also have uh, six different Portuguese varieties. So we do a Portuguese blend, and that's Amazing. sort of up on the hill. We have a really cool map in Salador, which indicates where all those varieties are grown in the in the vineyard and what wine they go into, which is great when you're tasting this. Yeah, and we can point to that that bit on the map, this yeah. is what you're drinking, and then I can point out the window and it's just over there. And Lovely connection, you know. Yeah, you, absolutely. You know where it's all coming from. It doesn't come far to get to yep. the winery. And such an insight for a visitor to yeah. be able to say, I'm drinking this amazing wine that yeah. came from the vineyard. I can see just it. Just over there, yeah. when the tractor, yep. it went, there's a tractor yeah. there when we're picking <laughs> into the winery, and yeah. you know, it's, it's just yep. all here, so yeah. Yeah, such a great connection to yeah. one place, isn't it? And that's yeah. what, what Yarra Yering is about really mm. isn't it that you've got these amazing blends that are created from multiple vineyards but they're yeah. all from one little place yeah so really and it's like get... a big single vineyard yeah in a way yeah tell us about your two most iconic wines so we've got dry red number one dry red number two what's your take on these so the dry red number one, um, Cabernet base blend. So uh, this wine is about structure. Um, there's a lot more tannins in Cabernet. Mm -hmm. The dry red wine number two is a Shiraz dominant blend and it's much more fragrant, uh, plush, soft, um, textural wine as opposed to the number one. Mm, so okay. Dr. Caritas used to say he believed in styles of wine, yeah, not sure. varieties. So both of them are, are blends of uh, multiple varieties. Awesome. Tell us about what's happening here. Okay. So this is the dry red wine number two, 95% uh, Shiraz, mm. co-fermented on some Viognier skins. So they bring mm. a fragrance uh, and sure. a perfume to the wine. 
With some bottle maturation, this is a 2013 vintage, mm -hmm. with some bottle maturation that turns into more a softness and a silkiness okay. to the palette. And so Viognier, just to clarify, is a white grape. Yes. So you're adding a white grape into a red... That's right. ...ferment. Yeah. So how did that come about? Is that a traditional thing or is it a modern Australian thing? So the inspiration for that is the Northern Rhone Valley in okay. France, uh, particularly Cote Rote, okay. where they do co-ferment nice. Viognier with Shiraz. So that's uh, where Dr. Caritas took this inspiration. Okay. And so he was the first person in Australia to make a Shiraz Viognier blend. Wow. Yeah, wow. the first one. It's a day of first. <laughs> and I notice mm -hmm. we have a cork, but some of the wines have a screw cap. Yeah. So how does how does this change the wine or how do you make a decision on what closure to use? So for me as the winemaker, um, the, a screw cap is the best technical closure that mm -hmm. we have today. Yep. A lot of people don't think it's pretty, but I don't mind the look of a screw yeah. cap. It's nice, it's embossed, it's branded. Yeah. And for me, the closure needs to preserve that wine until um, our customer ready. is ready to drink it. And for us, with our wines um, having this great cellaring potential, mm. that could be 10, 20, 30 years or more. So the screw cap for me is the best technical closure we have. Yeah. Traditionally, a lot of people like the romance of a cork. <laughs> it makes me nervous. This vintage, 2013, was the first year that we started doing cork and screw cap and half of this wine was bottled on the screw cap and it's all gone. This is why we ah, have the cork today. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Okay. Our two most iconic wines are called dry red wine number one and dry red wine number two. Easy to remember. Easy to remember. Yeah. Um, the rationale behind that naming is that Dr. Caritas, who I referred to, who was a botanist as well as a winemaker, mm -hmm. so very scientific in his approach to things. So the first wine he made was quite literally dry red wine and blend one. And blend one was always a I Bordeaux style. It's great, yeah. it's easy, isn't yeah. it? Um, so yeah, number one is always a Bordeaux style Cabernet dominant, mm -hmm. Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot. The second uh, red wine he made, again, dry red wine number two was Shiraz based, yep. a little bit of Viognier, uh, Marsan and Mataro. Those two wines are the most um, iconic that we have. Mm -hmm. They're both Langdon's classified, yes. um, which Very you important. be familiar yes. with yeah. um, on the secondary market, would be the ones that most people would come and if they're tasting anything, that's what they will, will ensure that yes. they, they try. They're very well known wines. Very well they? known. Yes, yeah. around the world as yeah. well as here in the Yarra Valley yeah. in Australia. Yeah. And so we are tasting dry red number one. Number one, yeah, which is just out the front window. Of so course. we can look at what we've, although it's just been picked, um, <laughs> but yeah, we can look at what we're tasting here. And so vintage 2016? This is 2016, yes. which is our current release, current release at the moment, soon to release 2017. And so this Beautiful. is based on a Bordeaux blend mm -hmm. and typically Bordeaux being Cabernet or Merlot um, dominant but blended through depending yep. on the region. And so this is really inspired by a European style of wine, isn't it? Yep. So it's yep. quite different from some of the really robust, very high alcohol flavour, some mm. reds we might expect from South Australia. Yeah. So how do you talk about this to your customers? Like how do you introduce such oh. an iconic, <laughs> brilliant wine? I know words fail me sometimes, but um, <laughs> So, so all of that, I mean, the, the history of it yeah. and, and the style, but also saying, I mean, we're in a cool climate, so the wine is is elegant. It's yeah. not a big, um, big red yep. muscular wine. Yeah. Far more elegant. A lot of the time, it's more about pouring the wine for them and having a bit of a chat, but just saying, just have a taste. Just have a See taste. See what you think. Yeah. And sometimes that's... an as easy a way to do it for people to make up their own mind yeah. because yeah and what do you love about it i think for me because they're so beautifully balanced and mm -hmm. elegant and regardless of age i mean you know we're lucky enough to sometimes open some very old bottles which are like oh, yes. little time capsules yes are they you open them and you know amazing even this 2016 beautifully approachable yeah 
balanced, still soft, but still with enough in there to be able to age if that's what you like to do. Yeah, it's got power, but it's really delicate. Yeah. It's really finely, finely honed, isn't it? Mm. It's very precise, it's yep. got length. It's all oh, going it's delicious. on. It is. <laughs> Lucky it's three in the afternoon now, we can <laughs> have a glass. Thank you for sharing this beautiful wine. I'm so delighted to taste it. My pleasure. Yeah, I look forward to having the rest of this glass. In a moment. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. My first experience with a Yarra Yarra wine was when it was poured for me blind at lunch. I guess, you know, it was it was one of those moments that a lot of our customers tell me about now, their first experience with Yarra Yering is very uh, kind of captivating and it, it, it really kind of draws you in. It's like you, you can't hear any other conversation. And I was smelling this wine, just thinking like, what, what is this and where is it from? It was so kind of seductive and different to anything I'd yeah. really seen before. And that was actually a dry red wine number two, so the wine we're going to, wine going we're to taste. taste. Yeah. Do you remember what vintage it was? I don't. It was from the 90s. Yeah. Wow. I guess, and then listening to people around the table talk about Yarra yeah. Yarra as well gave me this sense of awe that people had around the brand mm. and how amazing the wines could be. Yeah. Was there a turning point in the history of Yarra Yarra that, you know, did it start out iconic or was there some sort of thing that happened in the middle, you know, or somewhere yeah. along the line? Dr. Caritas uh, had been making wine here for about 10 years and the brand was relatively unknown. And um, then with the 1984 Dry Red Wine Number no. 1, he won an award in London for the best New World wine. Wow. Yeah, and then so all of a sudden uh, the demand for the wine was really quite high and 80% of his production was going to export. So that really wow. launched Yarra Yering onto the international yeah. stage. Okay. Yeah. And just to clarify, so New World meaning? Not Europe. Not Europe. <laughs> yeah. And Australia was really young then as a wine industry, wasn't it? So It, it was. You know, yeah. that would have been a huge deal. It for, was massive, I think. Yeah. Um, People tell me, you know, the, all of a sudden there was no stock of Yarra Yering here, whereas almost for, for 10 years he'd been making wine yeah. um, and it hadn't really been selling. And then this was when people started kind of knocking on the door. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's very cool. It just, it's such an incredible idea to think that he, at some stage, he couldn't sell the wine. You know, now you can't keep up. Uh, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's like people get upset with me sometimes. But you can't supply. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, times have changed. Yes. Getting quick. Yes. <laughs> so we have 2013 Dry yes. Red Number no. 2. Yeah. Tell us about the idea behind Dry Red Number no. 2. So this wine, um, the style of this wine is something that's really fragrant uh, and juicy and textural and spicy. And so something you could have early, like early on in its life, but it will also sell her. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I like to tell people that a good old wine had to be a good young wine. Well, that's a great thing to say. Yeah, so it <laughs> so doesn't true. get better yes. with bottle maturation, it just yeah. evolves into something different. Um, and that's really important as well. Yeah, okay. uh, and I try and tell people that they don't actually have to keep it. Although our wines will sell her mm -hmm. for a really long time, they also don't have to keep them for 20 years before they're allowed yeah, to enjoy okay. it. Because that's quite a difficult thing to understand, isn't it? How if a, if a wine brand has been around for a long time and it shows capability, then how do your customers decide? So it's such a wonderful thing that you can say that, that you know, it will be a young wine and it'll be fresh and fragrant, you know, or you can sell it and you'll get you know, a different experience. Yeah. And then also <laughs> the idea here at the cellar door where you can also taste you know, some of the older wines as well, which is what we're... That's what right. We've got and, and the current vintage um, does seem quite young in the glass. Sometimes, you know, they actually benefit from decanting as well, get some air in there. Yep. Um, and then we off have the offer for customers to try an older wine as well at the same time and compare them yeah. and see how they and will sell it. That's such a educational, insightful thing to yeah. be able to do at a cellar door. Yeah, it's great. So. That's what we try and do is... Yeah. is let people taste the wines, but also take them on a, on a bit of a kind of journey. It's one thing to hear about it. Discovery. It's yeah. a totally different thing to actually see them side by side. That's right. It? I can yeah. tell you this wine cell as well, <laughs> but here we can actually let you see taste it. it. Yeah. yeah, and how it changes.
So this is 95% um, Shiraz, mm -hmm. co-fermented on the Viognier skins, so you can kind of smell that kind of floral perfume in the wine. <sighs> And look at the colour. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's clear and bright. Bright and so purple. So there's also some Marsan in here, Marsan skins. So wow. yeah, that's also another white variety. It brings yeah. a bit of kind of texture and grip onto the palette. Great. And then a tiny little bit of Mataro as well seems okay. to give us some, some spice and some lift okay. also. And then a beautiful full palette weight, um, but there's a brightness there, an acidity, yeah. and that's one of the key markers for us that this wine has great cellaring potential. So ah, oh, the bright synergy acidity. in yeah. this is just extraordinary. Oh, Thank you. Delightful. Yeah. How does this differ from dry red number one? So the dominant variety here is Shiraz, mm -hmm. so that softer, um, more plush um, style of wine. Uh, the dry red wine number one, um, a lot more structure, so it's 65%. Cabernet, okay, and it's blended with Merlot Malbec and Petit Verdot. Mm. I guess the Dr. Caradus was very well known for his blending abilities, yeah. and so we're really, as a brand, this is a lot of what we do mm. is is shaped around blending of wines, and the idea being that when we put multiple varieties together, we can make a wine that is greater than, than okay. the parts by themselves. Yeah. Because that's quite a different approach to many Australian producers who make one, you know, there's one variety listed on the label. So how do you blend? Do you just get a sample from every tank and join them together in equal proportion? Or how do you, how do you start? <laughs> um, well, the number two, this one we've got here, is uh, the Shiraz Viognier Masa Mataro. This one kind of comes a lot more naturally to me in when the batches uh, look good and I'm like, yes, they meet okay. my requirements, the classification, I just start blending those different batches throughout their 18 month maturation. Okay. The dry red wine number one, the Cabernet base blend for me, it's a bit more uh, of a challenge. It's a bit more of an intellectual blend. This one I kind of feel it and I'm like, yes, those batches are right, let's put them together. The number one blend, I keep the Cabernet, Merlot, Malbec and Petit Verdot All separate. separate. And then I, I get them in their batches in tanks and then I take samples. And that's when the measuring cylinders come out, okay. the pipettes. <laughs> the science. Game face. <laughs> and, um, you know, th there's some very yeah. serious time on the tasting bench trying to get that blend right. Okay. Yeah. And so with the dry red number one, the main component is Cabernet. So how do you make the Cabernet for that wine? So it's our, um, it's the, the blocks surrounding the tasting room here. Mm -hmm and one's are slightly more elevated than the other. So, and the bottom block tends to give us more um, vibrancy, more acidity mm -hmm. uh, and more fragrance. Um, and then the top block is a little riper, a bit more dark, a bit more powerful okay. um, Cabernet flavour. Is that flavor. because it's got more, it's warmer? It's it would be marginally, so, but it's, okay. it's something I can't necessarily it's explain. Magic. It's the magic. Yep, yeah. okay. Yeah, <laughs> and then with those, We'll generally pick that block in four different picks oh, wow. to give ourselves a lot of blending opportunity, mm -hmm. different parcels. Some of that wine I will, some of the Cabernet I will leave on skins for up to a month oh, and have okay. this extended skin contact. Yep. So that's where I find a lot of that savoury element yeah, uh, comes okay. from. It, it changes the shape of the palette but also gives us this other element of, of those spices that we, we um, yeah. enjoy so much in that blend. And then I put the bookends together, so the Cabernet and the Petit Verdot, because I yeah. have very little Petit Verdot, sure. so that's always going to go in. <laughs> and then it's the Merlot and the Malbec where I play around a little bit with the percentages. Is it nerve-wracking to put that into a bottle? Yes. Yeah. yes. Because you I, can't take it out. No, you can't unscramble <laughs> an egg, right? <laughs> Once it's blended, it's blended. Wow. Yeah, when I came here, I was so excited about being the custodian and looking after this amazing old vineyard with this beautiful history. People would say, oh, are you nervous? They're big shoes to fill. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm so excited. Like, this is going to be amazing. Um, I can't wait yeah. uh, to, to taste the fruit and make the wine. Then when I had to blend my first dry red wine, number one, I thought, oh gosh, people <laughs> are going to taste this wine. They have an expectation. They have mm. an idea in their head. And I don't want them to be upset with me. So that one took quite, okay. quite a, um, you know, 
a longer blending um, process. Sure. Than perhaps. And perhaps tasting now. many bottles from the archive to get some sensibility about a few, not too yes, many. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a few, I see a few <laughs> gaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You've done a beautiful job. These wines are absolutely magnificent. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to taste them and to spend time with you. So thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>
uh, when coming back to Australia, um, I was looking for, looking for work. And I accidentally stumbled across a job. Um, it was at Shandon, uh, which is in the Yarra Valley. And from there, um, I kind of thought, wow, I can do this. And it, it felt good, it felt sort of natural. And, um, and it started from there. And so progressively we'd um, uh, thought about getting our own place and planting vines. Of course, everything um, does take a long time, especially with, with uh, planting a vineyard. So we did other jobs and I worked for other wineries and did a little bit of contract winemaking as well. But ultimately it was our, it was our goal to have our own place. Uh, the vines needed to go in um, early, so uh, we planted in 98. And that way, by the time we were ready to, to have this, um, the vines had some age. And that's important. Absolutely. Yeah. What was it about this region in particular that drew you here? My wife actually, Sonia, saw um, a brochure uh, when she was, um, she was commuting into the city going to, uh, going to uni and uh, she saw a brochure and it was from, from this area and it looked really nice, it looked green hills, a little woolly dotted sheep all over it and oh, that looks like a nice spot. Not overly well known for wine growing. There was um, an established vineyard and wine label from, from this area, from Murrindindi. And so we thought we'd come out and have a look. And um, we looked at a few, few places and then when we saw this one, we just said, yeah, that's perfect. That's the one. Absolutely perfect. Yeah, so it, had, it has the right aspect, lovely northerly facing uh, slope with not much um, rainfall, but lots of sunshine. Mm -hmm. So did soil tests and, um, and viticulturally it was spot on. So good for red varieties. So I, I followed my husband to Australia, so he's an Aussie, and so I uh, migrated to Australia in 1995, and that was quite daunting. So in the mid-90s, that was before internet, before social media, it was at a time where a phone call would still be like costing you $50 for five minutes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So you really reserved it for very special occasions. Yeah, and then um, I sorted out my career. That was wonderful. Uh, but I had difficulties settling in Australia. I was homesick. Of course. Just uh, very homesick. Um, and um, if anyone has ever experienced it, it's quite a yeah, it, it hurts, you know, it is a very painful experience. And um, so in a way that was for me the, the driver, the driving force to create our vineyard here. So it was just at the same time that Paul started his career um, in the wine industry. So um, the two obviously it all fell into place. Um, but at the same time for me it was more, I had to actually get my hands dirty, literally and put my roots down, you know, to, to make Australia my home. And, um, and that helped me, you know, to create this. Um, it, uh, it became then more and more my home. Wow, that's so powerful, it's really important. <laughs> Look, in, in the German language, you use actually the word Heimat. You have two words for your home. One is Heimat, so that's where you're born. And then you have your, your Zuhause. That's your then where you live. Yeah. Unfortunately, perfect. in the English language, you don't have those two words to describe um, the different form of emotional belonging. Mm. But pretty much, you know, creating the vineyard has just exactly done that. You know? Wonderful. That's it's really special. Yeah, makes for a beautiful place as yeah. well. <laughs> so, when did you lay down the first roots here for Sedona? Um, we saw the property for the first time in 1997 and um, it used to be a cattle property um, and we actually know we met the owners as well when we bought the property and uh, yeah and then we started in 1998 so there were already some existing vineyards around so we knew the area was good for growing grapes 
And um, yeah, and the first vineyard was, uh, that we planted was Cabernet Sauvignon, which is my favourite, in 1998. And we propagated all of our own um, cuttings, vines. So they were like our babies. Yes. And um, yeah, and then 99, we uh, continued with the Merlot vineyard. That's the one that we're actually standing in at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then we had a year off. <laughs> And then in 2001, we continued um, and completed the first 10 acres with Shiraz and Sanchovese. My husband wanted to plant something that is different, a little alternative, and back then most certainly it was alternative. It's a, um, a grape variety from Italy, mm -hmm. and um, it produces sort of medium body wines. They can be a little bit lighter as well, they um, don't, are not as tannin driven as a Cabernet is or a Shiraz is. And it's a fantastic food wine. What is it about Sedona's wines that sets it apart? That's an oh, interesting question. Um, I guess everybody has their own story. And so there are lots of wines, uh, all with their own story. And I think ours does have a bit of a, a heart and soul. So it's, it's all handmade. Um, it's from this little pocket microclimate in, in the middle of our valley. Wines almost speak to you. And I, I, I think that um, the stories behind them that they, they have an interesting palate uh, and quite a unique nose to them. And, and every wine is going to reflect its region. Mm -hmm. And there are some wines that could be different right next door to each other because of the way they're grown. And then from just from growing the fruit, then through to when the winemaker gets his hands on the fruit. And then everything about it, um, it changes from, from start to finish. So there will be no two wines that are the same. Mm. I think that's probably almost impossible, uh, but they all have their own uh, individuality and that's all I can say about ours is that they're very individual and very specific to this small area. Mm. Well, I would love to have a try. What have we got here today? Okay, so there's two, uh, two wines that I thought would be interesting for us to try. We have a Sangiovese, Again, it has, a, it has a story behind it. Oh, yes. Uh, and also Reserve Shiraz. Um, the Reserve Shiraz, uh, we started our first one in 2013 under a Reserve label. We've made one every year. Uh, every release so far has received 95 uh, points out of 100 um, with James Halliday. This particular one also picked up a silver in Hong Kong and a gold, actually, just mm, recently at the Victorian Wine Show. That one there, yes. Uh, so that was a 96 point score. It's a really lovely wine. It's very delicate. Uh, it's got lots of spice, um, full of character, and, and it's a good drink. Oh, very Ultimately, exciting. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, San Gervais, uh, this is obviously a little bit um, lighter, but good structure has some nice grippy tannins. Um, we actually, uh, okay, so the story behind the Sangiovese. Yes. When I was uh, working for, there was a winery in the Yarra Valley called Oak Ridge. Uh, just at the end of that road, uh, there's another winery called Yarra Yering. And at the time, um, I was looking for some good Sangiovese and I knew that they had very good Sangiovese up there. So this was um, pretty much, we call it the turn of the century. So I spoke to Dr. Bailey Carados, who was then the founder and the owner of Yarra Yering. And I asked quite politely whether I could uh, um, come around and, and um, help myself to some of his Sangiovese cuttings. This is something that you probably couldn't really do today because there is a bit of a, a phylloxera scare or nervousness around um, and so wandering into people's vineyards and getting cuttings isn't really the done thing so much uh, but he was uh, very obliging I said yep yeah, yep yeah, come over and uh, so after work I um, jumped into my um, uh, big old blue 1968 Mercedes which had a really big boot 
So um, I knew it how I could probably fit about 800 or 1,000 cuttings in there. Drove to the end, met him, we jumped in his little four-wheel drive um, buggy mm -hmm. vineyard thing and um, headed up to the back where this Sangiovese block was. And um, yeah, he, um, he told me uh, a fair bit about it, although he didn't know the clone. So it was unknown, a bit of a mystery as to what uh, clone of Sangiovese it was. But he did say it was quite vigorous, so it did require a fair amount of, of control. So yeah, I got my cuttings from there. Um, we planted out six rows here. Mm -hmm. Further investigation, I looked from the region um, from where Sangiovese um, comes from, and it's a, an area in Italy um, around uh, Montalcino. And they, um, they have, uh, again, quite an arid and dry climate like we do. Mm -hmm. uh, very similar rainfall and very similar uh, altitude. Oh, them go. being south facing, us north facing, mm -hmm. uh, being southern hemisphere. So similar growing conditions and I think the Sangiovese loves it here. Okay. It really feels quite at home. And we've had, um, we've had 294 out of 100s, 295s and a 96. Uh, so we've had a string of quite high ratings. Uh, this one here has already picked up a couple of medals mm. and um, it's really quite a delightful drink. Oh, wonderful. I think it's time to have a taste. Absolutely it is. As you can see it's got quite a uh, quite a vibrant almost crimson mm. colour to it. Um, generally the the main um, the main characters that you would get from a Sangiovese is often uh, a cherry-like fruit, quite lifted. Uh, sometimes um, uh, there's a little hint of licorice occasionally. Okay. Um, and they do develop some um, interesting characters with age. Okay. And the oldest one we have is a 2006. And we did recently actually do a 10-year um, tasting session. Wow. Uh, whereby we tasted 2006 through to 2016. Um, and they were all quite interesting and some of the older ones actually were really quite quite delightful. They had some really lovely um, aged characters, almost um, like a um, tobacco leaf type, mm. um, slight leathery flavour. So they're interesting and all very individual and each year has been quite individual too. Mm. That is nice. Mm. Lots of lifted fruit, um, good length, mm -hmm. nice tight acidity. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Sangiovese can be quite, um, quite high in acid. That's how it lends itself quite well to aging. It also makes it a superb food wine. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the benefit of, um, of that style of wine. I often call it a pizza wine or yeah, arancini, anything like that, mm -hmm. works, works wonders. I can definitely see myself having some arancini with this one. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. What is happening in the future for Sedona? Yes, we have some plans to add accommodation uh, to the winery. We have been researching this for quite a while and um, we thought a really good model is to offer a luxury clamping experience. So um, this means is our vision for it is to have um, a clamping experience that uh, can be used all year round. So it's almost like a a really fancy eco tent with a bathroom pod and a kitchenette heating and cooling. But at the same time, you still have some canvas walls and a canvas roof. Um, and uh, yeah, we're hoping to really um, make this place um, a destination for, for Melbournians who are looking for an experience um, out in the country but they don't have to travel too far. So on a Friday night, you know, you can leave the office and you can be here at seven o'clock 
and enjoy a platter and a glass of wine. Oh, it sounds amazing. I think I might have to come and check it out once it's all <laughs> up and running. It sounds exactly like what I would love to do. So you'd have these beautiful views. Yeah, even better actually, yes, because better. Uh, we're planning to have those eco tents up on the hill. So we're going to call it Sedona Eco Retreat. Yes. So because you're sitting above the new hillside vineyard, you're getting really a beautiful vista beyond even those hills there. Oh wow. And well, the sunset, that's second to none. Okay, so now we're on to the Shiraz. Shiraz. Yep. This is our 2015 Reserve Shiraz. A little bit um, um, darker in terms mm -hmm. of colour. A little bit more dense. Quite spicy and um, a hint of white pepper. Mm. Uh, there's also a few oak influences showing through as well. Uh, these, these shouldn't be a dominating feature of the wine, but they should support the wine. And so there's that, that, that hint of vanilla and there's a... People also pick up coconut and some other yeah, quite yeah. Um, interesting characters. You can definitely taste that vanilla mm -hmm. and the white pepper, different spice. Mm. Mm. That is richer now, richer in terms of the, mm. the fruit weight and the um, good length, lovely mm. aging potential uh, and quite, um, um, I wouldn't say jammy because that lends itself to something a little bit more ripe, mm -hmm. but it's, it's up there in that, that richer mm -hmm. um, fruit flavour. Definitely. Yeah. I can see why my dad wants a bottle of that one. That was absolutely delicious. I very much enjoyed that. And now I think it might be time for a snack to go with these wines, don't oh, you think? I think so. <laughs> I'm sure we can find something that will match. Yes. Perfectly. Wonderful. Well, this all looks incredible. Tell me what we're looking at. Okay, well, these are our um, artisan platters and it's uh, mostly local produce so we have um, some local cheeses um, feta which is um, with uh, garlic and thyme we have um, some gravelax which is uh, from the buxton area and a uh, trout mousse that uh, that we make here um, also local olive oil and a uh, um, a really really good duco which is uh, also now made um, in-house. There's some beetroot relish and smoked duck from Thornton. And uh, that's all paired nicely with some, some chocolate designed for wine and some lovely local sourdough bread. That all sounds incredibly delicious and I cannot wait to get stuck into it. I want to say thank you to both of you for having me here at Sedona Estate today. It's been marvellous and uh, cheers. 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 Prost.